Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next topic, which is different ways of randomization. We're going to talk about two specific randomization techniques. One is called blocking, the other one is called clustering. They're both very useful, and we're going to use some examples to show how to use these. So the two types of randomization that we often see, in addition to simple randomization uh, and complete randomization that we mentioned in week one, is blocking. Sometimes we call it stratifying. You probably hear that term actually more often than blocking. And so what you want to remember is blocking or stratifying increases power, whereas clustering can decrease power. And we're going to show why that's the case. So let's first go through blocking uh, with some, sometimes say block random assignment or stratified random assignment. So this is essentially a procedure whereby subjects are partitioned into subgroups. They're sometimes called blocks or strata. And then you go into each subgroup and you use complete random assignment within each subgroup. So when do you want to do that? Let's take a look at one example. So this is a very simple example. Suppose we have 20 subjects in our experiment. We have 10 men and 10 women. And our experiment design calls for 10 subjects to be placed into the treatment condition. So you could use complete random assignment or simple random assignment. In that case, you cannot guarantee that there are exactly the same number of men and women in the treatment and the control conditions. But block random assignment will be able to enable you to do that. So what does block random assignment do? Now you have 10 men, and so with the, within the block of 10 men, you randomly assign half of them into the treatment and half of them into the control condition. So that gives you five men in each condition. Then you go into the block of women. Again, you randomly assign half of them into the control condition and half into the treatment condition. So if you do block random assignment or stratified random assignment, that guarantees that the number of men and women will be equal uh, in each experimental condition. So that's how operationally how we do that. Uh, what about some advantages of blocking? Some of them are obvious. For instance, sometimes there are administrative requirements, which says that the treatment condition has to have a certain proportion of each type of subjects. It could be gender or it could be ethnic groups. Blocking will make sure that, you know, if the requirement is gender, that you have to have 50-50, blocking on gender will enable you to ensure that there are 50% men and 50% women in the treatment group. If it's blocking on ethnicity or race, if the requirement is that you have to have a certain proportion of each race in the treatment, blocking will also guarantee that. Um, so that in that case, you want to block on the race, and then within each race, you assign the required proportion to the treatment condition. What if you do a complete random assignment? If you go back, um, sometimes if uh, there's a minority group, when you do complete a random assignment, sometimes you can, it can easily happen that you don't get any observations. You don't have any minority members assigned to the treatment condition. So it also helps with what's called subgroup analysis. Sometimes we also call heterogeneous treatment effects. So we, we can block on the subgroup. So the subgroup, again, can be demographic groups, such as race or gender. If you block, you can make sure that you actually have the desired subgroups in your study, uh, in your treatment. And the last point is less obvious at this point, and we're going to use a numerical example to illustrate this, which is that if you block on prognostic variables, that can improve the precision with which the average treatment effect is estimated. So statistically, this is a preferred practice because it reduces, essentially, the standard error of the estimate. All right, so now we're going to use an example. Okay, 
So this is a cooked up example. So let's say we have the, the table gives us the schedule for potential outcomes for public works projects when they're audited versus when they're not audited. So recall that in the first week, we define potential outcomes. So that's the framework, the ideal framework, where you can observe each unit, both under the treatment and the control condition. So why not denotes the outcome under the control condition, and Y1 denotes the outcome under the treatment condition. So in this case, uh, the treatment is heightened financial oversight by government officials, let's say maybe more frequent auditing, and the outcomes will be the amount of money that's unaccounted for, and let's say in this case it's stolen um, by the bureaucrats. And we have two regions in this case, region A and region B. Let's say because of resource constraints, each region has the capacity to audit only two of its projects. So now let's look at the first two columns, which is uh, all subjects. And uh, next we see block A subjects. The last two columns is block B subjects. Uh, what you see here is uh, just by eyeballing this, this uh, data table, you realize that uh, the outcome, which is the amount of money stolen, on average is a lot higher in block B compared to block A. So block A subjects are a lot more similar to each other. So there's a lot of within block similarity, whereas block B subjects are also a lot more similar to each other. But there is a fair amount of difference between block A and block B subjects. So the bottom of, the, uh, of this table calculates the mean of the outcome variable and the variance, as well as the covariance. What you see here is that, uh, for instance, the mean, when you have all the subjects here, is 9.14 if they're not in the, in the uh, control condition, when there isn't heightened financial oversight. And Y1 is when there is fun heightened financial oversight. So it's, it's 9 and 5, whereas block A is, you know, respectively 4 and 1. And block B is 16, you know, generates 16 and 11. So the, um, there's a lot of within block similarity. So now if we calculate the average treatment effect for region A, you know, the treatment is going to be essentially what is the mean under the treatment minus the mean under the control. So for region A is going to be 1 minus 4, that's minus 3. For region B, it's minus 5. If you have both regions combined, uh, you're going to weigh the mean by the proportion of subjects in each experimental condition. So there are 14 subjects in total, 8 in region A, and, and 6 in region B. So you weigh the average treatment effect in each region by um, its proportion. So you get minus 3.86. So this is the first point, which is when you have blocks, you can calculate the overall average treatment effect as a function of the within block uh, average treatment effect, which is essentially the sum of the weighted average treatment effect within each block. Okay. So this is uh, on how you calculate the average treatment effect when you have block random assignment. And this, is, uh, this part talks about the standard errors. How do you calculate the standard error under blocking? So the first part is if you have complete random assignment uh, without blocking, then the standard error of the average treatment effect is going to be 3.5. Uh, under block random assignment, what we are going to do is to calculate the standard error within each block, which we have done in the previous table and then weigh it by the block level, uh, the number of observations within each block. So we, um, we have NA over N, which is the proportion of treatment subjects in block A uh, squared. And then the standard error in block B is weighed similarly. Um, that would produce the standard error for the 
average treatment effect, the estimated average treatment effect to be 1.36 in this example. And compared to the complete random assignment, this is much smaller. So this is what we mean by blocking reduces the variance or the noise in the estimation and increases precision. So statistically, blocking is desirable. So here are some of the, uh, you know, I'm going to summarize the advantages and also what to watch for uh, when you do block random assignment or stratified random assignment. First of all, when we make the design change, we improve the precision with which we estimate the average treatment effect. You know, in the previous numerical example, the standard error plummets from 3.5 to 1.36. However, you have to be very careful, which is a common error is to ignore blocking. When you calculate the average treatment effect, you went back as if it is a complete random assignment. If it is a block random assignment, you have to weigh the average treatment effect by the proportion of subjects within each block. So remember, after, after block random assignment, don't forget to compute the average treatment effect and also the standard error accordingly. Okay, so this is, this is something that's potentially a downside for blocking. But if you're careful as an analyst, you just remember that you need to calculate the average treatment effect and, and its standard errors accordingly. The next one is uh, clustered random assignment. Remember, clustered random assignment is when all subjects in the same cluster are placed as a group, either into the treatment or the control condition, and it decreases power. This should not be done unless you have to. Most of the times, uh, experimenters use clustered random assignment because they have to. Uh, so we're going to use a couple of examples to illustrate that point. So you should remember, as an experimenter, that clustered assignment is oftentimes a compromise because assignment at a lower level is not possible or causes problems. Um, so we're going to use the Uber tipping experiment that we talked about in week two. In week two, we use this experiment to illustrate the idea of a facing design. This experiment has a lot of interesting features. The other interesting feature is, of course, they use clustered random assignment. They also use blocking. So after we cover block random assignment and, and clustering, we're going to revisit this experiment. Okay. Remember, prior to the summer of 2017, Uber does not have in-app tipping, whereas Lyft did. And so in their PR campaign, which is dubbed 180 Days of Change, they enabled tipping, in-app tipping. The company, they naturally wanted to see what's the effect of that. And the reliable way of doing that is actually to run it as an experiment, which is to enable treatment and control groups. So the way they did it was essentially to start the tipping feature, enable the tipping feature in half of its cities for 10 days, and then face in the other half of the cities. So in these 10 days, the early group becomes the treatment group, right? And the later group becomes the control group. So they're interested in, number, in a number of outcomes. That's not quite the point of mentioning the tipping experiment here. But uh, let's take a look, you sort of a deep dive into their experiment design. So at that point, they randomized the launch across 209 operating cities in the US and Canada. So one can think of randomization as either complete randomization at the driver level or clustered randomization at the city level. What did they do? They actually, um, clustered at the city level. So there are two features, two more features, in addition to the facing design. Uh, the cluster random assignment says that, you know, each city is clustered either into, as a cluster, is randomized into either the treatment or the control condition. So 
One question is why didn't they randomize at the driver level instead of the city level? Think about it, and、um, it would be a good idea to actually write down some notes, and then we'll, we'll discuss it. So the main reason、um, that they cluster is because if you randomize at the at the driver level, there will be potentially a lot of、uh, spillover effects. So imagine I drive for Uber, my neighbor also drive for Uber, and I saw this app on my、uh, this、uh, this this new feature on my on my app, which says that now you know you can accept tips. And I ran into my neighbor and asked my neighbor, you know, isn't that interesting? Now we can tip, we can accept tips.、Uh, and the neighbor is in the control group. The neighbor will be surprised and say, "Gee, you know, I didn't, I don't have that on my phone."、Um, so that would cause contamination、uh, between the treatment and the control group. And we'll talk about the the problems in the last week of this class. So, because of this, primarily because of a concern for the spillover effects, they made a compromise and used clustered random assignment.、Um, the other part is they actually also use block blocking within the same experiment. So, how do they do that? Um, here's how they use blocking. So, 110 cities were assigned to treatment by match pairs. So, which means that they stratified on whether a city has Uber Pool and Uber Eats. So, the cities with these two features are in one block. The cities without are in another block. Then, within each block. They form matches by minimizing the Euclidean difference across normalized city size, driver earnings, demographics, and so on, which essentially the match pairs are as similar as possible. Once they do this, they will randomize each pair into the treatment or the control group. Okay, so that's that's the blocking part. So then the remaining cities are randomly assigned to treatment or control. So in the end, they have 105 control cities and 104 treatment cities. So this example shows that within the same experiment, you can use multiple features. You can use blocking, you can use clustering, and you can use a facing design. Now we're going to take a look at another scenario where clustering often happens, which is that it's politically infeasible to actually、um, randomize at a lower level, at the individual level. So this is an educational、um, education setting. So we have classrooms. We have four schools: schools A, B, C, and D. And each school has three classrooms, and we denote it by A one, A two, A three, and so on. And let's say that the treatment is to have an additional teacher、uh, in the classroom. So in this case, you can imagine that you, there are two levels, potentially two levels for randomization. One is at the classroom level; the other one is at the school level. What's the problem of randomizing at the classroom level? It will give us more power because then there will be more independent observations, right? The problem again could be spillover effects, or it could more likely you're going to run into political feasibility. So, if imagine that A1 has an additional teacher, whereas A2 and A3 are randomized into the control condition, the parents would know that somehow, for some reason, one of the classrooms has an additional teacher. So they might complain. In that scenario, oftentimes、um, in field experiments in the education setting, the experimenter often randomizes the entire school、uh, as a cluster into the treatment or the control condition. Again, we can look at classroom level potential outcomes and the、um, school level、uh, or the cluster level potential outcomes. So in this case. Um, the experimenter can randomly assign two of the four schools into the treatments. How many possible random assignments can you have?、Um, it's going to be 
4 choose 2, which is 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 factorial. So there's six different ways of randomly choosing two out of four schools. Uh, across all randomizations, this is something that you can calculate. You can compute the average treatment effect as well as the uh, standard deviation across all possible randomizations. But then uh, we can look at the alternative scenario, which is complete randomization at the classroom level, at a lower level. In this case, there will be a lot more randomizations. Um, so it's, you know, 12 classrooms in total, and you choose six out of 12. And so how many different randomizations can you have is going to be 12 factorial over 6 factorial times 6 factorial, which is 924. And then you compute the standard errors across all of these different randomizations. It's going to be 1.6 in this case. So clustering in this case led to an 81% increase in the standard error, which means that the standard error goes up, it's becoming a lot less precise. Um, so that's the trade-off. That's, you know, for political feasibility, you're randomizing at a higher level, at the school level, and the resulting standard error is going to be a lot larger. So what are the implications for estimation when you have clustered random assignment? When you have clustered random assignment, this affects the sampling distribution. And if you have clusters of unequal size, it presents a problem for difference in means estimation. So this problem goes away as the, the number of cluster increases.